Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you guys once again for joining the 980s podcast hosted by yours truly, Kevin Thompson, founder and CEO of 980s Capital Group. Thank you guys for joining us. As I always say, subscribe to the channel. As I always say, go and get my book, MLB to CFP, live on Apple Books. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can reach us at www.9inningscapitalgroup.com. Schedule an appointment, or you can send us an email at 9innings at 9icapgroup.com. Send your emails with your questions, comments, or concerns. If you want to listen to our YouTube station, go to YouTube and type in 9 Innings Capital Group there. If you want to listen to the audio version, you can go to the audio is iTunes or SoundCloud and type in 9 Innings Capital Group there. Thank you guys for being loyal subscribers. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. And as you know, we're here to do what? To educate, empower, and engage. And today we have a wonderful, wonderful guest, Mr. Jonathan Clements from The Humble Dollar. Jonathan Clements author editor of the humble dollar of uh, 20 years of finance industry in the finance industry we are lucky to have them let's get it we have jonathan clements from the Humble Dollar, thank you for joining us today, Mr. Clements. Hey, Kevin, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, I, I, this, this is an honor. I mean, what you've done in the financial industry, your 20 years in the business in regards to Citi and, and, the, and the Wall Street Journal, uh, all the things you've done in regards to the books that you've been writing in regard. So for example, how to think about money and from here to financial happiness, which can be found on Amazon. So please go ahead and check that out. If you guys are listening and want to listen to some good financial topics there, and you're on the advisory board of creative planning, which is one of the largest financial advisory practices in the United States. Hey, I just appreciate, appreciate having you. Thank you for giving us some time. And I want to start somewhere which I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand or get or don't even grasp is is you the, you're the editor of the humble dollar and and a lot of people don't understand what the humble dollar actually is so I want you to kind of go into what the humble dollar actually is and we agree and we appreciate the opportunity to to not only subscribe to the humble dollar but actually be a partner in in, in building some content there as well so thank you for that but tell the people a little bit about humble dollar and how it came about so humble dollar pretty much came about by accident. Mm -hmm. I uh, left Wall Street back in 2014. I went back to the Wall Street Journal for another 15 months. But one of the other things I did when I left City was to put out an annual financial guide. Mm -hmm. And I did it for a couple of years. And what I realized was it was, it was getting too stale too quickly. I put out the book as of January 1st each year. And you know, by January 8th, the information was stale. So I decided, yeah. forget about this. I'm just going to throw everything on the web. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to do it under my own name, even though I own the URL, jonathanclements.com. So thought about it, thought about it, and finally discovered that there was this URL, humbledollar.com, that was available. So I bought it. I threw all the contents from this annual financial guide onto the web, made it freely available. And then it occurred to me, well, well, I've got this website up there. Maybe I'll blog perhaps once a week and I'll invite a few people I know who are interested in personal finance to blog as well. So mm -hmm. that's how it started out at the beginning of 2017. And it was, um, you know, just sort of rolled along and then it gathered speed. Yeah. <laughs> and so I went from, you know, putting up a couple of pieces of content uh, a week to today, I'm putting up. Uh, at least two new pieces every day. There are all kinds of features that are part of the site that were not there you know, six years ago. And with every passing month, it gets a little bit bigger. In fact, it's got to the point where you know, it has essentially swallowed my life. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, one of the hardest parts is trying to limit the amount of time that I devote to the site. Yeah. And for me, somebody who you know, is semi-retired, the working harder than ever, mm -hmm. you know, the site is my way of giving back. It's really designed to provide a sensible forum for people to understand what prudent money management looks like. There are all kinds of sites out there that are going to tell you what the hot stocks are, how to buy cryptocurrency, you know, trying to persuade you to buy this credit card or that credit card so they get a kickback from the credit card company. I'm not doing any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. What we're focused on is 
trying to help people be more prudent managers of their own money. And that, I think, makes Humble Dollar distinctly different from almost anything else that's out there. Yeah, I, you, you, you allow people like ourselves to, to, to contribute to the blog, and we definitely appreciate that. So what made you think or, or go about saying, you know what, I want the average Joe, I want the average man to come out, or average man or woman, of course, uh, to come out and just give us a little insight on what's going on in their own financial lives. So where'd that idea come about? So Kevin, I mean, you're actually a little bit different from the typical humble dollar contributor because you know you have the professional education to be a financial planner. Mm. You know, most of the people who write for the site are Joe and Jane investor. These are people who have a strong interest in personal finance and investing, but they do not necessarily have any sort of professional credential. Yeah. So what I say to them is, all right, you are not an expert on the financial world. You cannot claim to be one, but mm. you are an expert on your own life. Yes. You, know, you have gone through buying a home or dealing with the death of a loved one or trying to you know, figure out whether you should buy long-term care insurance. So if you talk about your experience, mm -hmm. you have a lot of credibility. The other thing we know about this sort of storytelling is that it is a way of connecting with readers. I mean, you know, we are apes who tell stories. <laughs> that is what distinguishes human beings. Yeah. And you know, you can tell people all kinds of statistics and they'll go, eh, whatever. Mm -hmm. But if you tell them a compelling story, they will listen and they will internalize it. So, you know, what I'm hoping to do with these articles by everyday investors is to provide compelling information in a way that resonates with readers. Well, I, I just appreciate it because I, a friend of ours, a friend of a friend of our mine, of course, James McGlynn, uh, referred me over, and and I was like, wow, this is incredible stuff, and I've been reading it ever since, and I appreciate the opportunity just to get a new uh, insight on what people are thinking uh, on your Humble Dollar blog. And for those who haven't gone to Humble Dollar, I, I suggest you go to Humble Dollar, you subscribe, you list, you, you read, and there's a lot of good commentary there. Um, you also have written uh, written multiple books. One in particular, uh, or particularly how to think about money, you bring up some key points. One particular point I want to talk about is you say that we are hardwired for financial failure. So sensible money management takes great uh, mental strength. Tell us a little bit about what that actually means in your opinion. So we know, and this is particularly evident to everybody right now, that you know, we are not 100% rational. You know, our feelings about money change over time. You know, as we've watched the stock market decline this year, we watched the bond market decline, we've watched mm. cryptocurrencies decline. Mm. You know, people have gone from being ebullient about their financial prospects to deeply pessimistic. Yeah. And you know, a little bit of pessimism is fine. The problem <laughs> is when you act upon it. Yeah. And there will be a lot of people before all is said and done who will deeply regret what they do during this current bear market. There will be people who swore up and down that the stocks and stock funds that they were buying in 2021, they were going to hold for the long haul. And right now, you know, at fire sale prices, they, they are dumping those investments. And why does that happen? Well, one of the things that we know from behavioral finance is that we are what's called loss averse. You know, we feel the pain of losses something like two times as greatly as is the pleasure we get from gains. Yeah. So right now, that loss aversion is kicking in big time and it's prompting a lot of people to panic and sell and they will regret it. Yeah, I mean, the, anal the analytics are there. I mean, when you look at the, the long-term time horizon, since 1950, and this is from Guide to the Market, JP Morgan does a very good job of putting a lot of analytics out there, but since 1950, a 50-50 stock to bond portfolio over a five and 10 year trailing uh, rolling period has never been down. 50 has never had a negative, a negative downturn. So it's like, I, I tell my clients that all the time, like let's just remove behavior. When we're talking about investing, we're talking about five, seven, 10, 15 year timeframes. We're not talking about tomorrow. So you're absolutely right on that. Absolutely well, I think one right. of the problems with you know, 2022, of course, is that, you know, 
bonds aren't necessarily providing the diversification that people expected. You know, I mean, we have the broad stock market down around 24, 25% right now, but even the broad bond market is down 11%. And that's mm. painful for people. They're not getting the protection from sort of the broad bond market that they were expecting. This is one of the reasons why I personally try to play it super safe with the bond side of my portfolio. So I tend to own only short-term government bonds, whether it's conventional government bonds or inflation index bonds. Mm -hmm. And with that sort of portfolio, the damage to the bond side of my holdings has been far less than it is for those people who went for that, those broad market index funds. Yeah. Yeah. And then <clears throat> another key point is some of the people who are, are in those bond funds versus actually owning actual bonds. When you have, when you're holding to maturity, it doesn't hurt nearly as bad versus if you have a bond fund is cons consistently losing money and losing value. It, it's just, it's two totally, totally different investments, but I try to help explain that to our clients for sure. One of the things that uh, has also been interesting about this year, and it's, it has been much remarked upon, but I mean, it is worth noting that after a decade when, you know, all that seemed to matter is owning U.S. stocks. If you yes. own U.S. stocks, particularly large cap U.S. stocks, you know, you did brilliantly over the past decade. And finally, this year, it's not huge, but if you had a globally diversified portfolio, you had some developed foreign markets in there, you had some emerging markets in there, your losses in 2022 would have been somewhat less. In fact, despite all the comment commentary about emerging markets, they're actually the best part of, of the global financial <laughs> markets right now. Wow, and it's, it's, it's hard to think that because especially with emerging markets, and I don't know how China is considered an emerging market. Sometime in most emerging market portfolio, China is the largest piece. And I'm like, well, they're the second largest economy in the world, but that's, that's, a, that's a side of the point. But uh, you mentioned the media, and this is, this is a good point. Financial media, they'll, they'll show that big CNBC, but show that big bear come across the screen, like arr, roaring at you. I mean, how much of an impact does the financial media have in behavioral finance? I think it has a huge impact. I mean, what we need to be successful investors is to have a long time horizon. As, as you mentioned, Kevin, you, know, you need to be looking ahead 10, 15 years. But when we follow the financial media on a daily basis, our attention is right now on mm -hmm. what's happening right now. And you know, we take that information and we are tempted to act upon it. So if people want to help their financial future, they should one, turn off the TV. <laughs> two, they should not pay attention to what happens to the financial markets on a daily basis. And three, they should stop regularly looking at their investment portfolios. I mean, if you could just get out of the habit of going online and seeing what your holdings have done each day, you will be a calmer investor and you will sleep better at night. Yeah. And that's a great point. And I tell, and, and let's kind of uh, change gears a little bit. Talk about like the retiree standpoint, right? People have to understand that the, 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 the traditional retiree now is living some 20 to 30 years inside of retirement. So it doesn't necessarily mean you have to go completely conservative once you retire, because you still have to have some equity exposure in your portfolio to offset inflation. So with that being said, it's the same kind of concept when you're talking about a 65 year old or a 66 year old individual, we have to plan for 15, 20, 25 years. It's still a long-term time horizon. Do you agree? Or, do you agree on that? No, absolutely, Kevin. And w one of the things that you, know, you have to realize is, yeah, you know, a short-term stock market decline is, is a problem and you don't want to be selling out of stocks to buy groceries, yeah. but you sh should also look at what's happening in the world today and what's going on with inflation and think, if I had everything in super conservative investments, every day I am losing purchasing power. Yes. But, you know, we have inflation running seven, eight percent, you know, bond yields are what, maybe two, three percent. That is a prescription for poverty. Yes. <laughs> so what you need to do, even as you make sure that you can cover the groceries with, you know, short-term bonds, you know, with cash investments, you've also got to be thinking about how you're going to make your money grow for that period beyond uh, the short term. So my own portfolio, even though I'm not fully retired now, you know, I am on the verge of living off my portfolio. So it may sound like 
crazy talk to people, but I actually have just 20% of my portfolio in short-term bonds. And I have the 80%, the other 80% in stocks. You know, you know, all the, all this financial planning stuff, you know, according to Bill Bangan and the 4% withdrawal rate, if I've got 20% of my portfolio sitting in short-term bonds, I have the next five years of spending money there. Yeah. And then meanwhile, you know, I am wagering um, that, you know, over a five-year period, stocks will make money and that I will be able to, at some point, to be able to cash out some of those stocks over the next five years, replenish my short-term bonds so that I have spending money for the next five years. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not saying that people should have 80% in stocks like me. I'm, you know, mm. I, <laughs> I, I may be fearful when I'm on the highway, but, you know, in mm. the face of market declines, I am completely unbothered. Um, but I do think that most retirees should be thinking of having at least half of their portfolio in stocks. Absolutely. I, I, thank you for this conversation. So for the last question, um, what would you tell the people today uh, that are watching the financial news, like you just mentioned, like turn off the TV or the retirees that may be feeling fearful right now because they're, they're wanting to retire in a bear market. What would be your, your, your advice to them and, and to help them get over the hump of saying, you know what, everything's going to be okay. So Kevin, like everybody else in this business, you know, I do not have a crystal ball. I yeah. cannot predict what will happen next. But what we do know is that we've had a lot of bad news and that bad news is already reflected in the prices of stocks and bonds. You know, just because inflation may be higher down the road, just because there's a chance that there's a recession, that is already built into the prices that we have. People expect that now. And so stock and bond prices reflect it. It's only if the news turns out to be far worse than expected, will we see another big leg down in the market? The typical bear market decline is 34%. You know, we are already at 24 or 25%. You know, there's a good chance the worst is already over. So forget about the losses and think about how you're going to profit from the eventual market recovery. And what that means is that you should think about saving more and putting that money into stocks. You should think about rebalancing your portfolio. You might think about taking tax losses and then taking the proceeds of those tax losses and moving them into better diversified, lower cost investments. This is the time when you're going to set up your portfolio to profit from the recovery that's coming. I can't tell you when it's coming, but you know, trust me, five years down the road, if you buy today, you will be a happy camper. I've been telling my clients, uh, especially those that are in IRAs or qualified accounts, I'm saying, Hey, think about doing a Roth conversion right now. Think about converting some of those lower cost investments over to a Roth. Yeah, you pay taxes now, but think about when it goes back up. Wow, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, no, actually, it's funny you say that because that is exactly what I am thinking about doing in the weeks ahead. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been trying to figure out how I can do a big conversion and still stay within, in my case, the 24% income tax bracket mm -hmm. so that I don't get you know, hammered mm -hmm. on the, the tax bill on the, the conversion, but also knowing that down the road, if I don't do that conversion, mm -hmm. I could end up with much bigger withdrawals from my um, IRA that could put me into an even higher tax bracket. Absolutely. Absolutely. This has been a wonderful conversation. Jonathan Clements, editor, founder of The Humble Dollar. Please go ahead and check that out. Great articles on a daily basis coming out. From, from guys like myself, from, from this regular everyday man who's coming out there having conversations about maybe it's how to buy a home or how to refinance or anything like that's been happening in the financial markets. It's on the humble dollar, Jonathan Clements. Mr. Clements, thank you for your time today. We appreciate it. Anything else you would like to leave? Any final thoughts? Any I final like thoughts? To, yeah, go, just like you said, Kevin, go to humbledollar.com. Subscribe to the newsletter. There's no cost to it. And I think, I think you will like what you read. Absolutely. Thank you again. We appreciate your time, Mr. Clements. And thank you guys for joining the 90s podcast. Thank you guys for all the, the, the subscriber growth. We appreciate your time. As you know, we're here to do what? Educate, empower, and engage. We'll see you guys next week. God bless you.